So I was listening to what's his face, Tim Dillon, on um, "We're Drunk." What's that podcast called? "We're Drunk" with Mark Norman and what's his friend called? Um, that's a pretty good. Let me see if I can find it. He's actually on Kill Tony's live at the moment, premiering. So big up Tim Dillon for that one. But yes, yeah, the podcast called "We Might Be Drunk." That's with um, Mark Norman and the other dude. I forgot his name. I don't know his name here. But this is a really good pod. I'm going to actually play a bit for you on it, um, where they talk about. It kind of, I think, applies to... Obviously, I think they're talking more about Matt Reif, but I think their points that they speak about um, comedians and their come-ups and what you'd prefer in terms of would you prefer to blow up really quickly and then fall off or would you prefer to kind of have it slow and steady and then fall off? I'm not really too sure. But um, I really need to play this and show you the bit that I kind of liked that I want to speak on because I think it's really, really informative and really might give it an insight as to why maybe Brennan's where he's, where he's at now at the moment in his career and maybe this might give us an insight into it and we can kind of expand on it so i can see if you guys agree what what i heard on here which i made the timestamp of what happened when it happened but let me see if i can find it here live on the stream yeah, yeah it's, it was fine for the moment i think during the pandemic all those things were good okay, where think, you were like yeah we got a house okay i think it might start right here let's see now what if we lived in houston it was also like yeah. the people were vacationing right. in lot in like other alternate realities. Yes. So they were like, what if I lived here? That was the pandemic. And the pandemic, everybody was like moving around. People, some people bought houses, other places. Some people were like, what if I lived here? You I went to Austin for I, a minute. I lived in Austin for yeah. a while, for a year, you know? And you so hated it? I couldn't do it. It wasn't for me. I love my friends that live there. I love Joe. I love the club. I, I just am not a guy. I like oceans. I like, you know, I like just where I kind of grew up. Like, I love New York City. I I like L.A. It took a while to like L.A., mm. but I, I do like L.A. Would now. Would you ever come back? To, to New where? York? To New, New York, York City. of course. Mm. I would come back here, hey. sure. Really? Well, For sure. Austin's a college town at the Austin's end of the day. Austin's a college. Let's see. Where, where is it? Come, come on. Let's see. it. Where is it? Come on. Let's get to the bit. If Bottom not, just out. move on back to Toronto. Yeah. Good. Good. Away. They need to hear that. And then they go, they go, yeah, you're probably right. But they go, what do you want? You know, and I go, yeah, yeah right. Oh, this is cool. Same. I'm a young guy on the road. Yeah. But I remember doing uh, laughs in Kirkland, Washington. Mm. And I was in this like crackhead motel. Yeah. To the point that a fucking, a crackhead passed out against, you open the window and his yeah. head is against my window. I'm like, that's fucking, <laughs> wow. that's dark. But I remember there being a pancake house next door. So I was like, it's great. You know? Yeah. I tell Maureen, I'm like, great hotel. Marina Franklin calls me. She goes, "You stayed here." Exactly. Yeah. She got she got moved, obviously, but uh, but back then you were like that's not yeah it was nice. I think if you're a woman, there there might be more. You uh -huh. might have more of a thing like, "Hey, I don't feel safe." Of course. Yes. yes. You know? I can't call up and go, "Hi, I feel vulnerable. <laughs> no. I feel vulnerable right now." Someone else called when they saw you. Yeah. Right. Right. That. Right. <laughs> they were like, "We got a real problem yeah. here." The meth heads are yeah. like, "Let's clear out, boys." Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it, it, it's fun though. But those those early times are, I think, some of the most pure fun. Yes. that you have. Yes, when you're with a bunch of comics, you take a road trip. Like I remember, Jared Freed took me early on. Yeah, this is he a did bit. a gig in. Uh, where did Jared Freed? He had like a standing gig at like was it Foxwoods or I think so. I think it was Foxwoods. It, it might have been Foxwoods. It was just it was just a road trip with comics, and you just got to go perform, and then we'd come home. Yeah, it's but two it was hours. just fun. You're in a car, you're joking around. Well, you know what? It's you like know? the it's like Katrina. Katrina's obviously horrible, devastating, but we had fun. Right. Because we're running around, we're setting fireworks, we're looting, we're shooting right. guns. Yes. So it's it's yes deadly and horrifying, but it's also freeing. But in then a for way. some people, the problem is, I guess Katrina doesn't end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's exactly. still some people now with fireworks going, let's go. And you're going, right. oh, I have a family. Yeah. You know, so it's hard. Yeah, exactly. I remember those, that Foxwoods gig. The owner was one of the. So that? anyway, there's another bit that I haven't, I've missed out on, but there's a bit specifically where they speak about basically popping too early. And I think it's a really important section. I wish I could remember what bit it was, but I'll probably ed import, I'll probably edit it into the clip when I probably clip it up later. But in the section, they talk about the importance of coming up with that sort of like struggle first and then when you pop you kind of level off back to where you were before and i think maybe that's the reason why it's really a bad thing to be an overnight success it probably isn't the best thing especially when it's a career like stand-up or like, even like what well, i'm into djing and stuff where it's usually a long grind you're probably better off grinding until your 40s then making it and then later on kind of leveling back out again as opposed to making it really early in your 20s when you don't really 
deserve to make it you don't have the tools and the experience to handle the fame or the money or the attention or the negativity and then it kind of going the other way because that's what happened to brendan at the moment right if we go to t-fight care at the moment he's his list of dates is kind of sad like considering where he came from where he's at now at the moment um why can't i go onto the website is it not let me go i'm a blocks from the website <laughs> I can't go to the, they blocked me. Maybe they blocked me. If we go on his tour dates, his tour dates are very thin on the ground. Like, look at that. Like, that's kind of bad considering the level he's at, to be fair. He was usually playing, he'd usually have these kind of Mondays or these on the March next year. He'd usually have, like, you know, basically weekends all stacked up. And now they're kind of spotty, you know, in terms of gigs. Like, his next gig he's playing is December 8th. He's doing two Fridays in Chicago. He's doing basically a weekend in Chicago. Um, then he's then he's not playing again on the eighth. He's only going to play in this in January. Then Austin, um, Edmonton, February, San Jose. For, yeah, so it's kind of spotty all over the place. And the reason why I'm saying this is like more so like I know there's a contingency of fans, especially on the Final Kids sub, who probably do want to see him like out on the street begging for money. But I honestly think like the worst thing to happen for somebody, I think, is this. I'd much, I'd much prefer to be on the street begging for money because I know my dream's over. Like, I much prefer the finality of it being over. I'm not sure about you guys, but I'd much prefer it know it's over and it's done than live in this, you know, constant state of nothingness, right? Where it's like death by a thousand cuts. Like, he's kind of living in um, comedic purgatory. He's neither successful nor a failure. He's right in between and it's just like dead, that's really the worst place to be, especially when you consider where he was. You consider how flashy that Showtime special was, right? You'd be surprised. You think of the money put in behind him from Showtime in general with MMA and shit. You think about all the appearances on Rogan. To be to, to get to a point now where the podcast is hardly doing any numbers, um, he doesn't have a lot of tour dates, and it really has stagnated for him or slowed down, it's a really bad sign, in my opinion. It's a super, super bad sign. And I'd much prefer the, fi the finality or the almost fatality ending of like it's over you know it's done it's over and i can just move on to another stage in my life as opposed to what he's doing now because now he has to kind of you know he kind of has to just like make it work with the best that he has but really at the moment it's really fucking crazy and it obviously isn't going to get any better anytime soon so that's all kind of how i say on that thing like i said i wish i could have the full clip of what they said on here let's see if i can actually see if they played anything more but that clip was really good where they speak about the whole thing let's see if they, they said anything more on the end here and then we can move on to the next bit an older guy who owned it oh, he was yeah. the type of drunk that would always oh, start crying but now he, he, he went to mohegan sun oh, oh good yeah. and then and they took me out and i actually like those guys they took me out for yeah. lobster lobster rolls we ate lobster rolls but yeah they get emotional yeah he would, he would always start and yeah. i'd be like I, i'm not comfortable with that but he, would, <laughs> but he would just be like i'm so happy you're back i'm like why are you that why is this a crime yeah, yeah. i don't know your last i kind of like it a little <laughs> i, I like it. it a little let me tell you right it. now when a grown man starts crying there's something i go you realize the gravity of this moment you yeah know? yeah i go i'm glad because you know I, i'm eating a lobster roll and he, he does get wistful oh yeah you know and he got wistful and i go this is insane yeah. and uncomfortable. But it's like, Tammy Pescatelli. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't call me anymore. Wistful yeah. in a casino is never good, no, though. No, it's not. It, no. In that green room, they were just stocking. Like, it was like, it was hell. I hated that gig. Always. That was a tough gig. Because everybody loses money, then they come to your show, and they hate you. You, you, me, and Chris Stefano did it a, a long time ago. We had this writer following us, this guy, uh, Scott oh, Robb, who's I a great writer. Yeah. He, wrote, he wrote a bunch of guy from Cleveland, very, very bright guy. And he uh, he was in the green room. He was like, they treat you like th like the way they talk to us. He was like, this is crazy. I yeah. always think if my parents could see this, they'd be like, come on, what are you doing? But now it's yeah. great. Now it's fine. Now it's good. You get there. You graduate. It takes a while. you're all connected while. through a struggle, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's boot camp, baby. Yeah. I call it Mein Kampf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People in Gaza listening to this going, oh, really? <laughs> We're players. like, it's like a war, really. <laughs> you play a strip mall? I'm in the strip. I'm in the strip. <laughs> People are like, really, a struggle, yeah. huh? Okay. Right, no, it, right. Was, it was fun. It was it's fun. fun. It's the, the, the hardest things are the funnest. It but was so fun. Living, I lived in a, a five-story walk-up on the fifth floor. Uh, I had a, a shower in my kitchen. And I know who you lived with. And you know time. who I lived with. Yeah. And that was, I mean, woof. Oh, uh, yeah, and Cosby. You know, and it was, it was Cosby. <laughs> but... A big up chocolate drop. Appreciate you, brother. Perfect timing.
Join time while I clean and get ready for the week. <laughs> My two cents. Seems like the gap between good and bad comics is more noticeable lately. Yo, big up um, Chocolate Drop. I appreciate you so immensely. Thank you for the super chat. Hmm. I'm going to have to agree somewhat, but I also think maybe by and large, most comedians just aren't good. I'm starting to get to that point now because there's a point when I was doing a stream where I used to say, I'm getting to a point where I was thinking beforehand, you have to go to a live show in order for you to have fun. In order for you to enjoy comedy, you have to experience it live. That's why I initially thought. Then I'd watch certain comics, I'd be like, no, certain stuff is just good when it's good. Then you watch good comics and it's shit and you're like, oof, you're good though. Why are you shit? And it makes you think, hold on, what's going on here? Then you see other comics who are good put out consistently shit projects and it makes me think to myself, maybe by and large, most stand-up comedians are overrated and it isn't their fault. I think a lot of it has to do with podcasting. If you're, if if somebody you think is really funny, you're probably going to listen to their podcast if you're a comedy fan. You're probably going to listen to the pod. You're going to watch and hear them on other shows. So you're going to kind of follow them around. You're going to in absorb a lot of their content, absorb a lot of their life stories, right? And a lot of their life stories go into their comedy. So a lot of the stuff that you hear on stage, you've already heard it before in some way, shape or form. Or you've heard the timings, you've heard the perspective, you've seen and heard too much from them for their stand-up material to be fresh and to hit the way it needs to hit. You know, it's just too much. So I think maybe podcasting and the accessibility you have to these people is what's affecting people's ability to enjoy their stand up. Because once they finally do put that stand up out, it's a little bit like, you know, like Andrew Schultz is a good example. I think Andrew Schultz on his pod is pretty an entertaining, fun type of dude. But I think if you listen to Flagrant, if you consume a lot of Andrew Schultz content, I'm pretty sure you're probably going to tell, you're probably going to be able to figure out a lot of his bits you'll probably be able to know what direction he's going and you probably recognize a lot of the stuff he's spoken about via his you know rants that he goes on in his podcast so it kind of takes away the surprise factor the fun and just the funny so i think i don't know where i stand on it really i'm just rambling there but i don't know where i stand i don't know if i think all comedians are overrated anyway so now that they're all doing specials we're all seeing them in real time and realizing oh they're not all that great or if really the only way to enjoy stand-up comedy properly is to actually go and watch them live because there is something about it. Like, again, me being an up-and-coming DJ myself and doing my DJing sort of stuff, you can't then, like, as much as I enjoyed watching DJ live streams, as much as I enjoy recording a DJ live stream, we can't argue and say that a live stream is the same as going to a nightclub. It's not. You can enjoy a shit set in a nightclub with drinks, with drugs, with good company, more than a live, live stream. You can be able to notice all the ever. So I think there's something in that. I don't, know, I don't know if it's like for like, but I think there's something in being at home, under your duvet, watching a stand-up special on Netflix on your laptop, with the phone in your hand, with your kids running around, your dog jumping up and down on you, your partner talking to you through the walls. It's not the same experience of being inside of a club right a dingy dark club a theater whatever it is drinking a bit eating a bit being in, in a room full of people who all love the same person that creates a different kind of energy different type of synergy different type of relationship right experience so that probably adds to the fun and most likely i'd assume i bet you any money again i haven't i need to go to an open mic i haven't been to an open mic in in never to be honest i don't think so but i'm gonna go to an open mic maybe i'll go to one this weekend but i bet you if you go to an open mic and most open mics are shit, right? It's just shit comedians who are just on the come up. I bet you, you will laugh more at an open mic randomly than you would if you went to go see a show. You probably would because there's just so many freaks on the stage. But it's also your day in person, right? You're with different people. It's a different crowd and shit. You probably have a lot more fun in that situation. So maybe that's the reason why stand-up specials are doing badly. It just doesn't translate online. Maybe that's just a thing. I don't really know, but... I can say, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, most of the standard specials I've watched in the last year or so have been very average. And this is, and it covers a whole breadth. It covers from people that are new, people who are mid, people who are mid-level, people who have got loads of experience. Like, it's not been great. It's not really been great, the standard so far. It's been absolutely horrendous, to be fair. But big up, <laughs> uh, big up Chocolate Drop. I appreciate the Super Chat, brother. But it was just fun. It was always fun. You got to go on the roof and you'd smoke a cigarette. Yeah. And Do you smoke? You, no, but I would. Back then I yeah. did because like you, now I can't. You get in the mid-30s, you got to go, no. Right, you know, I'm right. in the late 30s now, but it's like, 
eventually you have to say no. But like when you're 25, there's no reason not to have a cigarette. Yeah. True. Anyone listening is 25. Yeah. Uh, there's just no reason not to, especially when you're on a roof and you want to talk shit about who got JFL. Exactly. exactly. There's nothing better. You light nothing. up a cigarette. And you're like, God damn it. Yeah. And the nicotine's kicking in. Yeah. You're like, I've been pounding up. the pavement three years. <laughs> yeah. you know, what is that person? At? Right. You know? Well, we all we're talking about how rough the beginning was do you think you can bypass that now with the tiktoks and the reels and all the podcasts Kathy Griffin had a great line years and years yeah this is the this is the bit this is the bit that i think applies to brendan i think this definitely does apply to brendan and maybe a little bit to matt rapper i think more so to brendan as to why he's in this weird position at the moment this is the bit i think years ago the and Trump she head? said <laughs> she said this is Trump." no <laughs> she um she said uh you pay your dues an hour later Say it again. You pay your dues now or later. Oh, so what's interesting is like that's great. I, I do think there's gonna be a time in every career, even if it is a rocket ship, right? Where you're gonna level off mm. or something. Well, you know, like interesting. I do think eventually you do. Ha- it, you can't avoid it forever. Right. You might not have to go to do what we did, but again, we're admitting what we did. And it's fun. Yeah. Sure. The dues some people have to pay aren't fun imagine because here's the deal some people are going to get really successful early on and make a lot of money and then for whatever reason things really cool off and people don't care i would wager that's harder yeah it's oh, actually really? harder when you're not young and broke and you have that camaraderie and you're like fucking like you have that energy of like we're all doing it and everything like that but when you just get to a certain point yep. And, you know, because some of that's isolating, right? Some of the, like, yeah. succeeding and all that stuff can be isolating. True. And then, then having to pay those dues or figure something out right. might be harder. You, might not, you might not be equipped. I mean, when you... And I agree. And I think that's exactly what Brendan's issue is. Because imagine Brendan's journey. He starts off doing stand-up special... Well, he starts off doing stand-up based on the level of fame that he had with his podcast which is the, obviously the wrong way to go about things. Looking back, and actually at the time, I don't think it's a hindsight thing or a Monday morning quarterback. A lot of people at the time were saying to him, hey, you should do open mics. Hey, you should go hang out with, you know, new comics. You shouldn't be hanging around with Joe Rogan and Bill Burr and stuff. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to go the other way. So he starts off doing comedy shows based on the success of the TFAT K at that time. The Fire and the Kid at that time, um, people people don't remember this now because it's so shit now, but TFAT K was good for a period of time. And TFAT K, even without Chris D'Elia and Will Sasso and Brian and all these other guys and early Theo, TFAT K with just Brendan and Brian back in the day was getting like hundreds of thousands of views easily without even botting they were getting hundreds of thousands of views without buying views so they were super successful they had a really big you know they were always selling out tickets and shit doing live shows so then he starts doing stand-up based on his podcast audience but obviously he's not experienced in stand-ups but he's just doing you know theaters and big rooms and it doesn't match his level of comedy but then to be fair to brendan it's hard if you think about it to be that famous quote unquote in podcasting and then be happy to go and do like bar gigs and shit right in comedy clubs and stuff and open mics it's quite hard to go to to like you know to have that sort of audience but then willingly put yourself in places where you're with amateurs and shit and you're amongst a smaller crowd and stuff that doesn't know you why would you do that willingly but obviously the issue here is that as somebody says logo focus here that what that is part of the apprenticeship obviously it's one way or the other that's part of the apprenticeship and if anything what that probably does it probably gives you an idea of where you started from it gives you a realistic idea of where you started from and it probably makes a fall off feel less harsh because if you know where you started from hey i was playing in rooms with five people two of them on on their phone and three of them were fucking crack addicts when you then level out and you start only playing rooms of 50 people 50 seems like a big success compared to two but because he started playing in thousand capacity rooms, even though he was only one or two years into stand up, and now he's suddenly playing in bars and he can't sell out 30 seats, it looks really bad. You know, that fall off is super drastic because he's gone from thousands to not being able to sell out hundreds to canceling European tours and shit. It's absolutely crazy. Even He's even canceling, like, I'm seeing, you know, according to Unique and stuff, he's canceling like regular comedy club weekend as he's cancelling last minute like absolutely crazy like the weekend's coming up or whatever and you'll cancel on a wednesday a random like gig in fucking arizona or something it's like raw you can't even fill a 150 capacity room or table room and stuff like that that's when it gets really bad so maybe there is something to be said for starting off that kind of grind again not to eulogize the grind or not to kind of you know 
and put the struggle on the fucking pedestal because I think these guys also kind of suck their own dick too much about you know being on the road and doing shitty fucking gigs. You don't need to go through the shit all the time. But there is something about starting off relatively low and then building up that makes a lot more sense. It's, it's probably equivalent to YouTube. It's probably better on YouTube to stream to one person, to stream to 10 people, to stream to zero people, and then build it up little by little than to start and just buy your views. And then when you eventually then fall off, you have no idea where you started from. You know what I mean? Because you've just, you kind of fobbed the numbers sort of thing. So I kind of get that in that respect. So that might be the reason why Brendan is sort of like where he's kind, you know, it might be the reason where he, why he's where he's at at the moment. It's a weird place to be at because he should be a lot more successful considering the, the access he has, the connections he has, all this sort of shit. But clearly along the way, all the drama, the shit comedy, the terrible personality, you know, all the controversies with his friends, it's definitely starting to impact stuff and stuff is starting to get level out. But I still think fundamentally, the real main issue is the fact that the comedy stuff isn't good. That's what I always think. I I, I don't know if, about you guys, but I 100%, I 100, I 100, I 100% believe that the main thing that you have to do in most of these things, you just concentrate on the work. If the work is good, it doesn't matter. And I think most people don't concentrate on that. And I think, you know, that's the main issue. It's all this metrics, all this other stuff and social media outlay stuff. They don't concentrate on the main stuff. That's what I think. Anyway. But again, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Younger, right. It's like you're building towards it. But if it just hits you at like in your 40s, that is, it is weirder. Right. And everybody kind of turns on you when you pop quick and don't have to do all the, the do's. But that shit, that, I think that's just instinct. I don't like it, it either. And you got to fight it as a comedian. You, you got to fight sure. it. Because sometimes, sometimes someone will pop and you're like, why? I'm just being a contrarian because everyone yeah. is obsessed. And they'll like be like, this is the greatest. And you have to be like, it's fine. It's fine. It's yeah. not yeah, the greatest. It's, it's not bad either. It's Yeah, I think that people are invested in like a certain thing yeah. where it's like a certain sequence of events of people that have paid their dues but again it's like there's things people are doing that we're not seeing mm. that's the other thing right really? there you know sorry there yeah are <laughs> but but i honestly do again i think they're all trying to be i think it's in their position too it's a little bit what's that thing called it's like survivor's remorse right because effectively they've all been quite fortunate they all made it for the most part, I'm sure they have friends who didn't make it, but from that whole generation of podcasters that were doing stand up, they've all kind of made it in their own way. Yes, they're not all Matt Rife, but they've all got a they've all got an occupation where they could pay their bills from their content and from doing stand up. They don't have to work full time jobs. I think so for the most part, which I think is the main goal if you're these type of guys, right? You're a bit of a degenerate. You're a bit of a weirdo. You make crash jokes. You're a bit of a, you, you live an alternative lifestyle. So just being able to just do what you want should be the win. So they've all kind of won. But I think there's also a bit of survivor's remorse in that respect because they act like if you're a regular guy that's busting your ass, right? Imagine you're working two jobs, but you actually have the dream of being a stand-up comedian. And then you see Brendan make it. I think you're allowed to hate. Like, again, I, I don't think it's constructive. I don't think it's going to hate help you long term, but you're allowed to hate. You're allowed to scream at the cr at the cloud. You're allowed to fucking shake your fist in the fucking air. You're allowed to spit feathers if somebody like Brendan makes it and you're still struggling to get fucking booked in your local comedy club. You're allowed to hate if you've been in, busting your ass for ages and you see this guy just jump over you because he's friends with Joe Rogan. You're allowed. You're allowed to fucking cuss at the moon, you know, do a curse on him, juju, whatever. You're allowed to do that. It's not constructive, but I think that's perfectly fine. I think these guys are talking the way they're talking now because it doesn't really matter if Matt Rife makes it, if Brendan Short makes it because it doesn't really impact their careers. They're all kind of set. They've got their own audience. It's fine. But I think when you're on the complete, like there's people on the complete outside who aren't their friends, who aren't part of their crowd, who aren't part of their crew, who are extremely funny. They're sending out tweets online and making little jokes and no one's responding. They're doing TikToks and no one fucking cares, right? You're allowed to hate if you're that person. You really are allowed to hate. It's not, like I said, it's not constructive, but you're allowed to get that emotion off and then move on from there. But I think this idea that, you know, it's all good. Everyone kind of does everything. It's like, yeah, because you guys all made it. You know what I mean? You guys are the, the lucky ones. You started podcasting or content around the time when it was kind of new still ish you got in really early you made your connections with rogan because all of these guys have kissed the ring and you all kind of made it that kind of makes sense you know it's like who knows people do things and that we just don't know them you know yeah yeah like if yeah. some guy's a magician for five years and then becomes a comedian does really this, well this is a really good point three, 
it's like the guy was a, was you know what I mean? I'm not no I don't know if that's ever happened. Yeah, but everyone's you know I mean it's I think people if you don't know a person it's harder, but if you know that they're fucking hustling. There's a documentary called yeah. Magic Camp. I say that to say this. <laughs> <laughs> I always have an agenda when I say something. There's a documentary called Magic Camp and it's about these kids who want to be magicians. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's so sad because like the yeah, here it is. And I saw it years ago. And they're all trying to be magicians. And succeeding as a magician there's like two guys that have residencies in Vegas. Exactly. And then everybody else, their success is like, I drive a Ford Windstar yeah. to a birthday party. I get out in the back. I do the thing. People are happy. We are lucky in the sense that we are in a thing that when it, it can be good. Like yes. when you are a magician, it really cannot be good. And there's three. For, there's three, three guys. Yeah. There's like three. It's like David Copperfield, Lance Burton, Le David Blaine, and, and, and David Blaine. It's all Davids, and, <laughs> and, and Chris Angel maybe. Oh but yeah. It, but he's like a mentalist. Teller, but they're kind Penn of and Teller too. do it. You know. Yeah. That's five. But we're six. talking in history now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's like it's like imagine if your passion there was no root. Here, there's a root. There's a root. And there's a lot of us. And there's a lot of people doing great. So there's a middle class in entertainment. Unlike there's a there's middle ever class. Been. But that's the issue, though. There's also too many. That's a problem. Maybe in, in, in magic circles or the magic entertainment industry, whatever, maybe there's not a lot of magicians and there's not a lot of like high paying gigs and stuff. And maybe I'm sure there's a probably a, a good circuit where you can go and make good money doing your thing, especially online with content and shit. I'm sure there's people online making good enough money doing magic, whatever. But I think the issue with stand up comedy is that there's too many of them. There's too many of them. There's not enough opportunities to go around. I don't think so overall. And we've obviously, I think, reached a point of fatigue. That's obviously a point too. I think there's just a there's going to be a limit as to the amount of people you can entertain with stand up comedy. Not everybody enjoys stand up comedy as a as a piece of content anyway. There's plenty of people out there who watch podcasts that have nothing to do with comedy. They're just regular people. I don't know. Maybe it's influencers. Maybe it's people that you followed in sports. Maybe it's somebody that you like in terms of a reader and something. There's just there's just exactly um, Andrew Tate. They've exhausted it. It's just too much. There's too many of them, and they all have opinions. They're all fucking. And I think you know another thing as well. I've always thought with stand up comedians and podcasts, where I think it might have fell off. Maybe it's it's the need to entertain, or it's need to be a court gesture. It's the need to be funny, to to be the center of attention. Like they they demand a lot from you. They always want your attention. In every, you know what I mean. Like they're very they're very demanding and almost entitled as people. It feels like they want your ticket sales. They want your views. They want you to come to their shows. They want you to watch their content, buy their merch, interact with their videos, like comment. Like it's just a lot you have to give them, and it's a, it can be a bit exhausting. And you also have to kind of you know, put up with their fucking, like, Burt Kreischer. Every podcast turns into a fucking therapy session. You've got your own issues going on, and now they're giving you your issues, their issues, sorry. You've got someone like a Tom Segura complaining about, you know, flying private, all this sort of stuff. It's like, bro, like, some, you know, maybe read the room, some self-awareness a little bit, please. So maybe that is part of the issue as well. Like, there's just, it's a lot, you know, to be a fan of these guys and follow them for a long period of time. It's a lot. But I think, obviously, during the pandemic, you know, we're all kind of living in some version of lockdown. The virus is tearing the fucking world apart. Maybe it's fake, maybe it's not, who knows, but we're all locked inside. We can't do what we want to do. These guys distract you from the horrors that are going on TV, within your politics, within your country, cool. But then now the world is open and you can do what you want. Is it any coincidence really that everything's kind of like gone down a bit? It makes complete sense, isn't it? Like, why would you waste your time listening to these guys rant about the fucking election, about Biden, about Trump, about COVID, about this, about it's just like boring. You wanna you'd rather just listen to your friend in a bar or just do your own shit or hang out with your kids or walk your fucking dogs and shit. Like you have me look after your fucking cat, whatever. Like I completely understand why it's gone probably going the other way. That probably makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, there are people are like so I always look at it like I'm lucky that I didn't want to do something that I was know. so even actors when you're just an actor. Oh, the idea that's that tough. You're just an actor and you have no you can't do you can't do anything else and you just have to wait for somebody to go you got the part. That yes. would that would kill me. So hard. Kill me. That would kill me the waiting and, and uh but I I do think when we But isn't it the same thing though? They always say this about actors, but isn't it the same thing? Isn't Rogan basically the person that picks? 
basically. Like, again, Matt Rife is probably the only recent example I can think of of a, of a comedian that's coming new without having to be picked by Rogan or ordained or put on a platform. Most of them have to be picked, really. Like, even though it's not the same, Rogan kind of acts like Hollywood, really. He's basically, you know, he is Warner Brothers. He is Lionsgate. He is these, he's agents. He's everything, right? He's the one who ordains people and says, yep, you're the next person on. Like, it's kind of the same thing, really, to be fair. We started stand-up, like... The only thing that's different with Rogan is that he's... The only, thing, the only difference with Rogan and what I give him props about is that he's really selfless. Like, he'll put on 10 people back-to-back. -back. He doesn't, like, space them out. You'll have 10 people on back-to-back -back you don't really know too much about, and you'll give them a shot, and if you people connect with them, they'll blow up and sell more tickets. Like, he's really free and open with his platform, which I think is funny because I've always said on this stream, I think if there was another person who was... If there was another comedian who was Rogan... No, if there was another comedian who had Rogan's position, I don't think they'd be as selfless as he is. I think he's quite unique and that's a really special thing about him. Forget the comedy, forget his podcast. If you like it or not, I don't care. But I think the thing that sets Rogan apart and what makes him really special and what he, is a, he should get a lot of props about is the fact that he's really open to having anybody on his platform. But I don't think any of the... Like, imagine, imagine if Tom Segura was Joe Rogan. Do you think Tom Segura would let random comedians on his show and give them a shot and let them kind of do what they want? Like, come on, man. Even Burt wouldn't do that. Do you know what I mean? Rogan is really unique in that respect. Like he really, since he made his money and since he's richer than fuck and he does what he wants to do, he's like, hey, you can go and you can come on my platform. Yeah, exactly, Austin Casey. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Imagine Tom Segura being Joe Rogan. Imagine how much of a cunt he'd be. Even Tim Dillon. I'm, I'm, I like Tim Dillon. But imagine Tim Dillon was Joe Rogan. He'd be such a fucking cunt. He'd enjoy being the gatekeeper. He'd enjoy the power it gave him and stuff. Like it probably would go to their heads. They'd probably become they'd probably become tyrants, legit tyrants. I would watch the half hours on Comedy Central and be like, "That's what I didn't know yeah. that a, a lot of those guys were struggling to fill rooms on weekends." Oh yeah, oh was, yeah. But like, I just watched it. Like, big up Subpar Gamer. Thank you for your streams. I really enjoy your perspective. Thank you, Subpar Gamer. I appreciate your donation, brother. Thank you so much for joining. And as much as my perspective is enjoyable, I also enjoy you guys watching and giving me your feedback in the chat and stuff. You know what I mean? So it's good. It's not good to talk into a mirror. I've done that plenty of times. <laughs> it's just ended. Yeah. Which means the very demoralizing process of me sitting in a room with like Sean Donnelly and they go, all right, come in. And you just sit there and they go, now remember, you have your nightstick in your hand. <laughs> And because every role is like, you know, cop or like, you know, gambling addict who sees daughter. <laughs> yeah. Once a month. Alcoholic like dad. Police supervision. Right. You know, right. anyway, anyway. anyway, it's ended there. But you get the point, right? You get the point. Um, Like I said, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the Brendan Schaub story and how it's going to play out. More so just because it's a real case study on what not to do when you get given opportunity. Because I really am a big believer in that everyone's journey is their journey. I also don't think there's any one way to make it, but I also think there's some beauty, there's a beauty, there's a, not beauty, there's a, there's a, there is value in somebody giving you a chance on a silver platter. It doesn't mean you're going to just get it and run with it. You have to still decide to do the work. So the fact that he's friends with Rogan, I don't think that's a cheat. I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just that he fucked it up. Like he actually fucked it. That's the thing that's fascinating. Like he was, you know, an average UFC fighter, he didn't really do anything in football. And then he gets given this opportunity to really make a name for himself in podcasting and content creation and comedy and shit. And he fucked it like on his own. No outside forces, no nothing. And he's also got the ability to take chances because his dad's got money. He's got money. So he could take risks. He could like, you know, take a risk and do something interesting and cool, creative and shit. And still have the ability to bounce back and try again without having to go get a, a quote-unquote real job and he still fucked it that's the fascinating thing about him he's such an interesting case study in that regard like watching somebody really piss an opportunity up the wall is really like you can't take your eyes away away from it that's the one thing that i love most about watching this from afar so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out but i've also got a feeling as well matt rife's success has really broken some comedians brains i think a lot of them are talking about this whole come up thing because of matt rife like matt rife's success has really broken some of these comedians brains like they can't get their head around it <laughs> you know but i think it has to do with that he's really um kind of conventional in one way because you get why he made it right you look at him you look at what he looks like his delivery 
and shit, how comfortable he's on the stage, how young he is. And it instantly makes sense. It's like an instant sort of like Hollywood thing. Like, okay, cool. This guy was always bound to make it sort of thing. So maybe that's what's really frying their brains. But Matt Rife's success has really fucking fuck with them. I wouldn't be surprised in many green rooms across America, across even when they go on tour, I'm sure in every fucking groom around the fucking country, there are people in the States, obviously, there are people talking about him and his success badly and sometimes in a good way. I'm sure of it. I'm sure. Um, there are many of people out there that are, you know, many of size of people out there, as Brendan would say, that, are, you know, that are kind of trying to figure out their lives and what they should do next now that he's made it the way he's made it. It's fucking interesting how all these guys are. But hey, what can you do? 